Welcome to all our listeners. I will begin this session by reading a brief uh, bio of uh, Ms. Phyllis Wakeda. Ms. Phyllis Wakeda is the Chief Executive of Kenya Association of Manufacturers, that is CAM, which is a credible voice of industry with over 1,000 members. She represents CAM on various boards and chairs the Kenya Water Industrial Alliance. She is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and alumni of the Swedish Institute of Management, uh, Swedish Institute Management Program on Sustainable Business Leadership and Corporate Social Responsibility. Ms. Wakiaga is a United Nations Global Compact Network Kenya Chapter Board Chair and a member of the Kenya COVID-19 Fund Board. She was recognized among the top Africa economic leaders for tomorrow on the Trussell 100 Africa List 2018 and is one of the 2019 most influential people of the African descent, Global 140. I will now hand over to my colleague, Dr. Alex Awiti, for a short introduction to our topic today. Dr. Awiti. Uh, thanks, Yuki. Uh, Phyllis, thank you so much for honoring our invitation. Uh, you have a captive audience uh, dying to jump in, so I won't speak for too long. But we all know that the uh, you know, global trade is withering, supply chains have disintegrated, entire sectors are in decline, businesses are closing, hundreds of millions of that uh, some jobs will actually never return. Uh, manufacturing is a sector that we really struggle with as a country uh, to, 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 to get up and running, uh, to basically punch it at the weight that we think it should. And now then COVID happened. Uh, so what we're really looking at is we're at a crossroad, but we also suspect that the certain opportunities that COVID presents to us, uh, shortening supply chains is one of the things that everyone is talking about. Uh, are we going to start moving in earnest uh, with the mantra, make in Kenya and by Kenya? Uh, what are some of the ideas that your community, as a of manufacturers, are talking about? I know you guys commissioned a study that has been very well received, and we hope that you'll be talking about some of the, of the findings of that study. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to welcome you to start the conversation. Um, thank you, thank you very much, Alex and Jockey, for a good introduction and uh, for this series that you've been having around COVID-19. So I'll share some of the thoughts and some of the things we've been doing as Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Um, just to highlight, CAM is the representative body of the manufacturing sector in Kenya. So we work very closely with our members uh, who are the manufacturing sector and facilitate dialogue between the sector and government to ensure that we are creating a competitive and sustainable uh, manufacturing sector. And this COVID season has been a particularly busy season for the sector because we have had to ensure that we keep essential goods flowing in the market. We've had to ensure that we try as much as possible to support our members uh, to keep Kenya moving because uh, ideally the sector is really the engine that really keeps the economy going. So that has been something that has taken a lot of our time. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go into some of the thoughts we had uh, to share. Um, as you know, industry has been the cornerstone of our development since independence. And we have achieved uh, what we have as, as a country around industry by playing a central role in building and upholding our society to this day. Uh, CAM is 60 years, 61 years old this year. so through since 1959, even before independence, we've continued to play a crucial role in ensuring that the voice of industry is heard at government and in various decision-making platforms. And as the custodians of our economy, the onus is on us to stand strong as Kenya's development partners today and until the dark cloud of COVID-19 has passed. Uh, we all know that COVID-19 is unprecedented. Everyone has said that. It's something completely new that no one planned for. And because of that dynamic and how quickly it, 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 it evolves, it means that we've had to be very 
responsive and very alert to what is happening and to ensure that we support our members. Uh, of course, the pandemic has affected our members like many other businesses. Uh, and we do appreciate, at the end of the day, it's a health pandemic. And the main thing is to protect the health of, uh, and, li and, and lives of our citizens, our employees, and the people of Kenya. So we've tried as much as possible that in whatever we've done, uh, even for the essential good sectors and the sectors that have had to continue operating, that we operate with very clear protocols that safeguard the lives and the health of, 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 of the citizens. Um, so Alex spoke about a study we carried out. We carried out an initial study at the beginning of COVID, maybe that, that was in March, just to have a dipstick of what impact we thought uh, the, 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 the pandemic would have on the manufacturing sector. At that point, the big concern was around the fact that people would not have their raw material um, arrive in time. They would have to look at reorganizing um, some of uh, the, the, the destinations where they get these raw materials from. And um, uh, a, big, a big concern at that time because uh, uh, the, the, one of the key source markets, as you can imagine, was China. And the pandemic epicenter was China at that time was the concern that there would really be a slowdown in, in access of those um, um, raw materials. Uh, but we did a further survey uh, with KPMG, uh, which we launched two weeks ago, as, uh, as, as, as you mentioned. And uh, for this survey, what we wanted to do was two months later to try and understand what are some of the challenges that were facing the manufacturers during the COVID-19. We were also looking at the measures manufacturers had been able to put in place to combat the spread of COVID-19 as they continued their operations. And we also wanted to establish how manufacturers were adapting uh, to the changes brought about by COVID-19. The survey we carried out with KPMG was also seeking to look at the perception manufacturers had of the different measures that had been put in place by government uh, to try and support the economy and also to come up with proposals to address uh, any of the emerging challenges. So I'll share some of the statistics uh, that came out of this survey. So we established what the manufacturers' top priorities are during this COVID season. And the top priority for manufacturers at this point is reducing cost. Uh, because as you can imagine, there has been a drop in their revenues uh, because of lower demand uh, in the market overall for a number of products. So one of the top priorities is reducing costs. The second top priority, which was interesting, was that Manufacturers are also looking to ensure that they retain jobs as much as possible. So 61% of the participants were speaking about job retention being a top priority for them. Then 53% of the respondents said that improving cash flow was also a top priority. Uh, because as you can imagine, cash is king and manufacturers are trying to figure out how to ensure that they improve their cash flows during this COVID-19. Uh, on the other side, we had 40% of manufacturers who have had to reduce their casual work workforce. Because as, as you know, a lot of the workforce uh, or, or part of the workforce in the manufacturing sector is casual laborers. And 40% of the manufacturers had had to reduce that. And 73% of them said that they were retaining their permanent employees, despite the challenges that were coming with with COVID. Then we also looked at the response to the guidelines and protocols. The Ministry of Health, Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Industry through the Department of Occupational Safety and Health had issued some protocols that needed to be adhered to for factories if they were going to continue in operation. What we had done as come is really translate them into usable documents for the factory level. And the feedback we had is that more than 90% of the manufacturers were adhering to the guidelines put in place to curb the spread of the virus, such as ensuring they have sanitization points, social distancing, provision of PPE. So that was good feedback that more than 90% were fully adhering to the guidelines we had asked them to. Then in terms of sales, 91% of non-essential good manufacturers had seen a significant fall in demand so these are people producing goods that are not considered essential for this period of time. 
say things like furniture, maybe regular clothing, shoes, uh, products that are not necessarily essential in the fight against COVID. Uh, we had 91% of them say they had seen a significant fall in demand compared to the essential goods manufacturers. They had also seen a fall in demand, but only 74% of them had seen that fall in demand. Then in terms of production, we have 42% of the manufacturers operating at less than half their production uh, capacity. Then we had the average utilized capacities for MSMEs at 42%. Logistics, uh, we had 76% who were facing difficulties in local sourcing or importing of uh, raw materials. And we also had 67% say they were finding market access challenges. So these are people trying to access either our export markets in the region or, or abroad. Then cash flow, as I said, is one of the areas that uh, is, is a big concern for the sector. 79% of the respondents were experiencing cash flow constraints. Uh, and out of these 76, for the MSMEs, they were worse hit with cash flow issues because 86% of them said they had challenges with the cash flow. Um, then we looked at the economic incentives. Well, as you remember, His Excellency, the President, had given some incentives and uh, some stimulus package, which included the issues of reduction of VAT from 16 to 14%, um, the issues of corporate tax being reduced from 30 to 25%, and the other measures. The one that was picked as the most useful measure was the issue of having zero tax on income less than 24,000 meaning that you are able to see the people who are earning low incomes having more money in their pocket to be able to address the new expenses that had come uh, because of uh, the, 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 the COVID-19. The one that appeared the least helpful from the feedback we received was the reduction of VAT from 16 to 14%. Uh, then in terms of adapting to the pandemic, uh, the survey indicated that 78% of manufacturers had to swiftly shift their focus from increasing profitability, revenue, and domestic market share. So normally, the big um, priority would be around profitability, your revenue. During this COVID season, a lot of the priority is now around reducing costs, retaining jobs, and improving cash flow. So th there's a big shift in terms of uh, the priorities the sectors are looking at. Then in spite of the rising costs, manufacturers have not been able to adjust their prices. And this is really attributed to the moral obligation uh, to be supportive to the country as we move along. In fact, I've just come from a meeting with the competition authority where they say that they've been monitoring the market prices. And if anything, during this crisis, prices have either remained stable or come down. So that's a very interesting dy dynamic. And I think really indicative of the moral obligation that the sector know that we play to ensure that they keep prices stable and if anything, even try and reduce prices to enable Kenyans to navigate uh, this, uh, this pandemic. Then another, in the, another thing we looked at is that in order to respond to the heightened demand for the COVID-19 related goods, 23% of the manufacturers from 10 of our sectors have shifted their focus or ramped up their production of essential goods. So what we've seen, we've seen some manufacturers retooling and sort of using their existing production lines to now produce uh, COVID-related products. Uh, and this include things like uh, PPEs, bedding, sanitizers, disinfectants, canned foods, immunity boosting products, hospital beds, ventilators, so people have been able to shift their production to be responsive to the market need uh, that has arisen because of, uh, of, of, of COVID. And as I said, 10 manufacturing sectors are highly involved in the production of, of, of these products that are essential during this COVID-19 pandemic. And this includes our motor vehicle and assemblers, uh, because as you know, their vehicles required ambulances and things like that. The chemical and allied sectors, those are the different products. Um, you see the hygiene products that are being utilized, um, paper and paperboard, energy, electronics, and, ele and, and electrical, the leather and footwear, metal and allied pharma, uh, uh, and, 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 and other sectors. So 
those sectors are really at the forefront of producing goods around um, COVID-19. So in, in regards to the feedback we got, we therefore made recommendations to further uh, cushion uh, the economy. And these proposals have been tabled and uh, presented to, to, to the government. One of the key ones was clearing outstanding VAT refunds and pending bills. Uh, this is very critical. As, as, as I've shared, the cash flow constraint is one of the biggest challenges facing the sector. And it's critical then that the sector is liquid enough to be able to meet its obligations. So we have VAT refunds owing to the manufacturing sector. And as of last week, 10 billion had been released to KRA to pay these refunds. There are also the pending bills, uh, supplier payments that have, are outstanding from both national and county government that we are still pushing for the same to be expedited so that we can have at least some cash flow within the, 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 the sector. Uh, the other thing we are advocating is for government to reevaluate some of the tax reliefs. Uh, we had the Tax Laws Amendment Act that introduced a number of these um, measures that uh, His Excellency had, had put forward. But in addition to that, the same regulation introduced some uh, aspects that we think are counterproductive to supporting uh, the sector. We had VAT introduced on a number of items where this VAT was previously either zero rated or exempt. And what this is simply doing is increasing the cost of doing business locally. I'll share some of those examples. And, uh, and, and we, we are asking government to consider reintroducing the reliefs that existed. For example, on pharmaceutical products, we need to go back to zero rating, the pharmaceutical products. There's also the issue of providing relief on raw materials imported into the country for production. There's some of those materials that were touched in that bill. There's also the reintroduction of the high wear and tear allowances, as well as allowing businesses to claim the entire investment deduction allowance in the first year of use. Uh, this is something that was also uh, brought up in, in, in the bill. Then a third proposal we are making is uh, the provision of moratorium on changes in the tax regime to give room to allow businesses uh, to adjust. Uh, because as you can imagine, with the cash flow challenges, uh, the introduction as an example of the minimum alternative tax of 1% on income under the finance bill will really be a disaster to loss-making businesses that are already tight for cash if everyone is then required uh, to comply with paying this minimum alternative tax of 1%, whether or not the businesses are making profit. Then the fourth proposal we were making is around the establishment of an emergency rescue fund uh, to, which, which would be supported by development partners or government, where we are able to identify the most vulnerable businesses and entrepreneurs affected by COVID-19. And of course, the main ones would really be the MSMEs, who even in terms of getting credit from, from, from the banks would struggle. So our conversation is in swing on how do we come up with this rescue fund, um, and put together development financing, but also have a credit guarantee scheme that is supported by government so that the commercial banks are free to lend to support the MSMEs during this time. Then the other area is around widening the scope of social protection measures, uh, which can be done through an emergency response fund that target, targets vulnerable groups in society and workers who have lost their jobs. Uh, we've been looking at the numbers in terms of job losses uh, indicatively what has happened and if this continues to play out the impact it would have on both the formal and the informal manufacturing sector. Uh, we already have about, uh, we have three, about 300,000 formal jobs in the manufacturing sector. About 50,000 of them are at high risk or already lost during this period. And out of the 3 million informal ones, it is envisaged that about 1.5 million are likely to be lost if we don't have some of these measures put in place. Uh, so there might be need for an emergency response fund uh, that can support uh, the vulnerable who are affected uh, by these job losses. Uh, then the other proposal is about seeking additional support from lending institutions to further enhance the liquidity uh, of the manufacturing sector uh, so that commercial banks are able to 
uh, lend more. They, these, the measures that were put in place for the um, banks to have more liquidity to lend to, 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 to the sector. We've seen moratoriums, but not new loans for lending coming into the sector. So that's an area uh, that, that, that can be looked at further. And then increasing the moratorium for loan repayments, including interest, uh, to six to 12 months, uh, because this impact seems like it's going to be longer than the three month moratorium uh, that has already been granted. And also looking at decreasing interest rates to about 8% uh, from, from, from the current uh, percentage so that even for new borrowing, it, it can be done at uh, more competitive rates. And then also putting a cap on fees for rearranging facilities due to COVID-19 and an exemption for excise duty on those fees, which is currently at 20%. So this would also give a bit of relief to anyone trying to, re, to, to rearrange the facilities that they have. Uh, the other area that is key is around regulatory overreach, um, uh, the issue of regulatory duplication, overreach. Uh, during this season, I think it's not the season to really come down hard on, 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 on the sector on some of these uh, regulations. They're just trying to see how we soften uh, the approach and come up more with uh, conformity programs, compliance support uh, for the sector uh, that is already struggling uh, during this time. Uh, and, and, and these corrective actions would be more, more useful. And I think some of the conversations that we are having with regulators, like I said, the competition authority, are quite positive in terms of them saying that they are looking more at how to support and we have sensitization forums set up to support the sector. Um, the, the other thing is uh, uh, easing regulations on importation, for example, of raw materials and key commodities required. Uh, for, for the manufacturing sector during this time, and ensuring the ports are also facilitating quick clearance of goods and uh, reduction of costs. So, for example, increasing the amount of free storage time at ICD or the port for manufactured goods so that you're not incurring very high damage costs as, as you import. So I'll, I'll, I'll just close my remarks by sharing some of the opportunities and lessons uh, we have launched during uh, this pandemic. I think one of the things that the pandemic has re revealed for Kenya and many economies is the issue of over-relying on imported goods and um, the exposure this gives to, to, to a country uh, for, for certain primary goods. And uh, because of this, we are really having deep conversations with the Ministry of Industry on what are some of the products we really need to support and prioritize uh, local production, because today it's COVID, tomorrow you don't know what situation it is that really affects your supply chain or your importation of goods. So we are looking at really a lesson of how do we ensure we are as self-sufficient as possible as, 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 as a country. I think the other lesson uh, the pandemic has pointed to is the need for having resilient industries uh, and building industries that can survive huge shocks. Um, so that resilience of, 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 of local industries, ensuring we diversify even our sourcing for raw materials, and uh, that, 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 that we, we, we have um, contingency plans uh, within industry to deal with such eventualities. And that way we are able then to deal with external shocks much better, and uh, our sourcing market diversification can come in handy. Uh, during during this time. Uh, the other area is the importance of building competitiveness uh, into, into the manufacturing uh, sector in the country. It's a subject that's very close to our heart where we are constantly speaking about the need for us to be very competitive, globally competitive, and being able to produce at the lowest cost possible. This has been a lesson that it's something we need to tackle and tackle completely immediately because in the event of uh, any future shocks, if your cost competitiveness is not sorted out, it becomes a big disadvantage to you. So that even if you're trying to produce locally, your cost of production makes it hard for you to sell your product competitively. So eventually becomes a burden to consumers if you're not very, very competitive. And lastly, the need to have predictable and stable policies uh, within the country 
uh, to support uh, local production so that we see increased investment uh, coming into the country. Uh, and that way you ensure that you have the right amount of investment uh, within your manufacturing sector to be able to support you uh, during such a crisis. So those are some of the thoughts I have. Uh, we, we, we've had uh, during this season as a manufacturing sector and we are happy and, uh, to, to share any comments, uh, I mean, respond to any questions uh, that you may have. So over to you, Alex and Joki, thank you. Okay, uh, Phyllis, thank you so much. I'm sure the questions are rolling. You have presented quite, uh, uh, quite a bit of stats and numbers. So I'm sure our colleagues, just like myself, are trying to go back to their notes to figure out where they would start. But I think the big question really is, uh, uh, this is not new. Uh, this is not unique to Kenya, let me say that. Uh, but the measures that our government is taking are not necessarily the kinds of aggressive, robust measures that we need to rescue a vital sector such as manufacturing. Um, you've talked about cash flow. Uh, you've talked about uh, retain, re retention of jobs uh, as some of the key priorities that uh, our manufacturing sector colleagues and, and, and businesses have. Uh, and we know the role of lenders in this space. We know that we are one of the most highly priced uh, loan markets in the world. Uh, governments all over the world are talking about banks getting used to zero, zero interest rates. Uh, governments are putting tons of money in credit guarantee schemes to support not just medium and small enterprises, but also large corporations. Uh, you've talked about a raft of rolling back tax uh, incentives, uh, the 1% income uh, minimum alternative tax, even when you're not making money. I, I'm not sure the government is putting its mouth where the money is. Uh, given the power that KM has, you know, how much traction are you getting with these conversations with the government to basically understand that this is not global best practice. What the president, with all due respect, is suggesting is not global best practice. Um, thanks, thanks, Alex. Um, as, as, as you mentioned, CAM has really been at the table from the very beginning, uh, trying to unpack this crisis as it evolved. And we've made significant proposals on some of the things we think government should do. Um, they are, Areas that government have brought in those measures, whether it was the issues of cash flow to ensure we are paid. I don't know whether that, there's been a debate on whether that is a stimulus or just paying us our debt. Um, so that's one of the areas that at least we have gotten some traction. But you're right that some countries have really done some ambitious um, things around this. You've seen what, for example, countries have done on followed employees, where you're seeing governments actually picking up the bill to pay employees uh, during, during this crisis. You've seen, for example, the funds that have been put to rescue SMEs and people are being told to pay back after three years. So they're able to actually get their businesses back on the feet and, 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 and keep going. Uh, for our country, the reality is we must look also at the fiscal space we are in. And maybe that's the reality of the constraint we find ourselves in. Because we know that we, even before COVID, we were in a very tight fiscal space. So that leaves very little room for navigation uh, for government uh, to put in place these measures, even as we table them uh, to, to government. Say, for example, the fund that we've been trying to set up for SMEs, uh, it has required that government put in a significant amount to, 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 to give the credit guarantee uh, and for the credit guarantee scheme to be able to work properly. Uh, but government has not been able to put uh, some of those amounts on the table because, because of, of, of those challenges. And uh, I think that just really is one of the key lessons that, that as a country, we have to ensure that we are always prudent. We reduce our recurrent expenditure and we are in the right fiscal space. Because when these crises occur and you're not in the right fiscal space, it's very hard to rescue business. Even if we go with our ambitious papers and proposals and the reality of government collection or government revenue, 
does not enable them to give the support we would be requesting for, it becomes a very tight conversation. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a tough conversation we are also having in government to say, in the same way as businesses, during this period, we are all looking at our expenses and saying, how do we refocus our budgets? How do we cut down our expenditure? We are not seeing the same rigor coming out of government to say, we are going to really cut down our, our recurrent expenditure to ensure that uh, we, we are cutting our court according to our cloth. So that's a challenge that I think going forward, uh, we, we learn a lesson as a country. Uh, but even, even, even with those constraints in, 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 in mind, there are proposals that I think I've repeated to you that we are making, that we do need that rescue fund for NSMEs. If we don't do it, we are really going to see a lot of distressed businesses. We do need a plan on employees. Uh, because if this continues, we were at the Ministry of Labor yesterday, for example, and the tourism sector is on its knees. 90%, their business is down, say 90 or even 100% in some cases. And, and, and people have kept employees on the payroll for the last three months. And without a clear roadmap on how we are reopening, we, we need a way forward. How, how do they proceed? Do they keep these people on the payroll? Is government able to come in and, and come up with a plan uh, to, to deal with these followed employees? So I, I agree with you that there's a lot more we can do. Uh, to, to try and rescue businesses uh, during this season. Right. Uh, thank you, Phyllis. You have talked about um, one of the lessons that you have learned um, from this um, COVID pandemic is the need to have um, a resilient you know, manufacturing industry and the need to have globally competitive um, um, industry you know, with regards to cost competitiveness. There's a listener who's asking about innovation. Have you seen any new um, innovative ideas that are going to in the future? Because today, like you said, today will be COVID, tomorrow will be something else. So what has been the role of innovation across um, this pandemic? Have you seen new innovations? And maybe you can speak to how innovation can be used in the future um, to respond to um, unprecedented um, situations, maybe like a global pandemic. Okay, um, thanks, thanks for, for that question around innovation because the COVID pandemic has, has indicated to us, at least as, as, as an association, that our members can be pretty innovative and Kenyans can be very innovative. Uh, when, when this pandemic started, I think one of the conversations was that ventilators will be required and uh, we, got together our automobile sector. Automobile is one of the sectors within the association and told them, why don't you consider innovating a local ventilator uh, that can be utilized uh, during COVID? Uh, we got some of the access to some of the free um, uh, patents that had been opened up uh, during, during the COVID-19 and the team got together. And through a collaborative effort, they were able to innovate a local ventilator called Fumuaishi 2.0 that has gone through a number of checks and tests and, 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 and appears to actually be a very valid uh, uh, ventilator that can be utilized within the market. In addition to the automobile sector, we saw about two or three other members within the sector also innovate and come up with, with local ventilators. And I think you saw the same happen uh, within uh, some of the universities. So what, what, what we learned about innovation is that where there's a supportive environment, because for some of these things we did see, even the regulators speed up some of the processes of the technical committees, um, sharing information, that openness to really work closely with industry to innovate as quickly as possible was very useful. Uh, the other one that may not be novel is the innovation we saw around the responsiveness on issues like masks and PPEs. We moved from a place where no one was making masks locally to in a week or two, having enough masks locally for the population when the government said that it is mandatory to wear masks. A lot of them were produced locally, whether it's by some of, of our members who are also members of the Kenya Fashion Council, the SMEs, uh, different industries. So that responsiveness uh, in, 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 in basically coming up with new product lines, retooling your, your operations, I think, indicates that the sector is quite innovative and uh, with the required support can, can
can can go can can go and really go forward to produce a lot of products um, locally. So we've had people say that, say for example, something like gloves. Can you imagine all the gloves in the country are imported? So that innovation to see more people uh, produce some of these products locally will, will will be interesting. And we've also seen innovations around even water dispensers. You know, people manufacturing local locally water dispensers that are automated and that that are able then to respond to the hygiene concerns we have uh, around this pandemic. So, Joki, yes, we have seen innovation and uh, it's, it's, it's something that we want to drive more going forward. So, Phyllis, there's a question here from Mandeep Shah and he wants to know uh, what are some of the sectors and industries that are being prioritized in discussions with the Ministry of Industrialization? Um, um, uh, thank you. Uh, so for the discussions with the Ministry of Industrialization, uh, I don't know if there's a post-COVID, but going forward, um, some of the, of, the, of the sectors that we think are a priority are the sectors around the health sector. So medical consumables, uh, these are the things you, you use day to day in a hospital whether it's the syringes, the different, uh, different consumables that you use and dispose of, a lot of those are imported into the country and that's a sector that the ministry is seeing if we can prioritize locally. The PPE sector is also another sector. Uh, it's not just about COVID, but everyday hospitals are using PPEs, but a lot of them have been imported in the past. So that's a sector that is being looked at. The pharmaceutical sector is also a priority sector. The textile and apparel sector continues to be a priority. It has been a priority and it will still be a priority uh, into the future because of the opportunities that exist uh, for, for this sector and also for secondhand cloth transformation uh, within the country. Uh, food and beverage is, is, is a big sector and uh, with the agro-processing link, considering we are a very agricultural country, uh, the link between the food and beverage sector and uh, and, and, and the agricultural sector. So agro-processing as a whole is, is, is uh, another sector that is being prioritized. The automobile sector uh, is a priority, has been and will continue to be in the future uh, because there's also a lot of opportunity uh, within, within that sector. Then the packaging sector is also a very strategic sector that has been uh, prioritized by the, by the Ministry of Industry because for everything you make, packaging is always part of it. Uh, so if you think of the product independent of the packaging, uh, that's also not very strategic. So packaging has been uh, put as one of the sectors we need to prioritize so that we ensure that we have quality, affordable packaging locally uh, 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 available. Um, also issues around the the the, 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 the the e-commerce opportunities, um, that, that's a, a facilitative sector for, for the manufacturing sector because the e-commerce opportunity gives us additional platforms where we can sell our goods as manufacturers. So that's another sector that uh, is, is, is being looked at uh, uh, by, by the ministry. There is a question here from um, Michael Karinga, who is um, saying that factoring in the limitation that are now uh, being experienced by, you know, resilience on external markets for raw material, uh, are there cross-sector conversations that have been had to allow a focus on principal sectors such as agriculture and mining, just to name a few, are we seeing conversations across different sectors on how they can support each other, particularly on those um, key industries, the priorities that you have um, outlined, including agriculture and mining and all that? Um, uh, thanks for the question from Michael. Uh, as come, we, we, we have 14 sectors within us. So a lot of those sectors either rely on each other for different products or raw materials, and a lot of the conversations we are having are the value chain approach. So that across board, we are trying to see end to end how we can have full value chain uh, within, within, within the manufacturing sector. So for example, in the textile and apparel sector, 
the conversation is how do we ensure we have a full value chain from farm to fashion? And a lot of the agricultural sectors have that conversation. And I think the value chain conversation, pro I mean, presents a lot of opportunities for forward and backward linkages uh, within our sectors. And those opportunities ensure that we complete the loop locally and that the benefit and the multiplier effect of the manufacturing sector is felt within the country. So those are things we've done. We've done, for example, a sector deep dive report where within all our 14 sectors, we've tried to identify what are the value chains in those sectors? Where are we playing in those value chains? Where are the gaps? What are the opportunities for investment? And currently, further to the KPMG study that we carried out, we are actually doing a rebound strategy for all our 14 sectors. Because if we are going to be self-sustainable going forward, we need to completely look at how we, 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 we treat our sectors. Because we don't want to have a sector that begins at the end of the value chain and you lose out uh, of, 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 of the other opportunities uh, for backward integration where we have the ability to, to do that locally. And for example, if I'm producing a certain product and part of my value chain can trigger investment in the country because there's a captive market for use of that product, that's something that is a conversation we are driving across our sectors. So for example, I'll just give a random example. One of our members uh, was producing lollipops, but all the lollipop sticks were imported. So as part of that value chain growth, the production of the lollipop sticks, someone was able to set up and now they are able to produce their lollipops with sticks that are manufactured locally. So those value chain conversations uh, do go on within the sector and we try and also deal with any bottlenecks that are affecting the investment in the value chain. And one of them is the common external tariff review at ESC level, looking at how we have a four band structure that enables people to invest at different levels of, of, of the value chain and to find those as viable investments for, for, for them. So that, for example, you don't have a raw material and a finished product at the same tariff rate. That differential allows people then to invest across value chain. So, Phyllis, just on that point, uh, you know, many people who observe this space, the, especially the Americans and the Chinese, think that we, we, we're going to roll back all the gains through WTO and global cooperation in trade and tariffs. And, uh, and globalization is probably in, in its very last days as a, as a captivating uh, proposition. So what does this mean for supply chains, for instance? What does it mean for some of our markets? What does it also present for us in terms of uh, definite opportunities? Uh, as you just mentioned, the lollipop stick one. Uh, what, what are some of the other examples where we can tap into a local production uh, and energize our country in, in, in much more diverse ways in terms of feedstocks to our industries rather than relying on vast uh, overseas supply chains that get disrupted so precipitously by just a virus. Um, uh, thanks for that. Um, the, the, the world was one big global village. Um, COVID is challenging that, but I don't think it's going to change it entirely because we can't run away from globalization. And much as we want to drive um, and do a lot of things locally, there's a reality of competitive, comparative advantage in certain areas. And for certain things, we will still have to rely on the global supply chain. Uh, so there are two angles to the conversations we're having. There's the issue about the import substitution strategy, where we are saying that there's need for us to substitute and um, do a lot of the things locally that we can do locally, competitively, as much as possible. Because the other thing you don't want is a burden on the consumer where we end up with very high, highly priced products because we are trying to do everything locally. So there's also strategy around selecting what we want to import substitute and ensuring that at the end of the day, the burden and the brand does not fall on the consumer. Uh, so those conversations is something that, that, that is happening. I know at Ministry of Industry level, CAM level, where we are saying, within our different sectors. Can we look at the products that we can import substitute locally? What are the, some of the areas we already have a captive market 
that we can manufacture competitively locally or where we can't, what are some of the concessions government needs to give, what are some of the things we need to do at ESC level to ensure we are manufacturing competitively locally. So that's the import substitution side. And then the other side that still makes globalization relevant is export orientation, because at the end of the day, the Kenyan market is too small for you to grow a huge manufacturing sector. You have to be manufacturing for a market beyond the Kenyan market. So that's where the ESC market will still be re relevant. Comesa, the Africa continental free trade area, the AGOA opportunity and the conversations we're having post AGOA, the EU market. So the export orientation will then still require us to think globally as a country because the reality of growing a manufacturing sector is that you can only really grow a substantive manufacturing sector if you're going to be able to export a lot of those products. And that's why we still come back to the issue of global competitiveness, because if you're cost competitive, your product can then be a product that you sell within the region, within the world, and, 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 and continue to grow from, a, from, from an export angle. So uh, the reality is even post COVID, much as we are going to see reorganization of supply chains and people re-looking at how they source their markets, uh, the issue of exports and, and globalization will still continue to be a feature. The only thing that you'll see is maybe people will look for more source markets. You might see diversification out of China, where people will be saying, instead of over-reliance on having all our products coming from China, can we maybe diversify and have some of those markets in Africa or India or, or, or other countries? So uh, there's a question here about uh, skills gap in the manufacturing sector. Yeah. Um, what what essentially uh, is, is is CAM and his membership doing to to navigate this challenge? Uh, the, the the question appreciates that Tibet will continue to play play a role in skills development. Uh, is it a high time that we created a manufacturing institute akin to the what we see in the US and the UK to prepare, prepare job seekers with the right skills to get into work uh, right, right, right out of school. Okay, uh, thanks for that. We do have a manufacturing academy at CAM and we've had it for, I think, eight, eight years now. And uh, what the manufacturing academy was, going, was doing, uh, was set up to do, was to address the skills gap issue within the manufacturing sector. So what we do on an annual basis, we sit with our members, understand some of the skill gap areas that they've identified within the manufacturing sector, and then we tailor make courses. Uh, so we have a calendar year every month, a different course of the priorities that we've identified. We also do in-house trainings for our members uh, within their factories. We partner with different partners uh, and experts in, in certain skills areas. The other thing we do is uh, from a TVET and technical skills angle, we've carried out a needs analysis of the manufacturing sector to identify the priority technical skills gaps that we have within the sector. And, and, and based on that, looked at the technical institutes offering and the TVETs offering uh, these trainings around the country. And then we've partnered with them to carry out uh, a TVET program where we work with the technical institutes, identify graduates in the, in the areas we've uh, identified for, for, for beefing in the manufacturing sector. And then we take these graduates through a work readiness program and place them within the manufacturing sector for a paid internship for three months uh, under a supervisor uh, within our members uh, factory. So this program has been, uh, it's been running now for close to two years. It started as a pilot and we've, it, it's supported by GIZ and it's been rolled out again for a further three years uh, because it's been quite successful. The manufacturers have been able to retain over 70% of the people who've gone through the program in, in, in their factories. We also now have a, work, a job site where we list any of the people who have gone through the program and have the technical skills uh, that have been identified by, by, by industry. So in the next three years, as we roll out the second phase of the program, uh, we are sure that we are going to see a lot of alignment in terms of the technical skills uh, required within industry. 
then we are also taking it further to a sector level. So for example, the automotive sector is running a program on skills development where they are doing a, a TVET program for the automotive sector for certain skills gaps that they have identified. We've also now come up with a program for the textile and apparel sector, uh, and we've gotten the best uh, in-class trainer from, from uh, who's been recommended by the buyers of the apparel product, and we are partnering with NITA uh, to roll out this program for the textile sector. So we are going to see more uh, of such programs that even have a sectoral approach and specifically address the technical skills gap within uh, the protein sectors we have at CAMP. Right, so there's a question here from Anil Hamiz, who is asking how are contingencies in terms of food security, um, key survival aspects being considered in planning, legal and uh, rights framework? Um, the issue of food security is, is, is a very pertinent and important issue because uh, that is one of the obligations government has to ensure that its citizenry is food secure. And the reality is that as a country, this has been one of the big gaps uh, in terms of food security. We are still importing uh, some of our very important food from our neighboring countries or having to import from, 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 from other countries. So for food security, the conversation with Ministry of Agriculture is to see how we strengthen our agricultural sector in Kenya. Agriculture, as we know, is one of the devolved functions in the, in, 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 in the new constitution. And what this has done is it has led to a gap on matters of food security uh, because uh, agriculture is now not as supported as, as it has been in the past. Uh, because of that, we don't have, say, the extension services we require to, to, to support uh, the agricultural sector and, and ensure that the production is happening. Uh, for our manufacturers, we have a number of manufacturers who also utilize uh, this food as raw material in their production processes. And uh, the, the, the need for the sector to work closely with the agricultural sector to ensure that food security is a priority is something that we have been doing. And uh, we now have an agro-processing sector and a CAM led by one of our board members, Bimal Kantaria, uh, trying to address and ensure that we we close all the gaps around uh, food security uh, within within the country. So this is work in progress, a challenge for, for, for the country that then requires that collective uh, effort from both the manufacturers, government, and the agro-processors on the ground. OK, so this is the last question, and we're going to get it from Eric Joroge, who is saying um, there was a great presentation from CAM. And um, while Phyllis has provided insights going forward, this pandemic has brought about uncertainty from a psychological perspective. People do not know how to deal with the new risks and issues, uh, in this case, COVID-19. What steps are being taken to address the myriad of mental health cases emanating from one, loss of income, and two, um, adjustments to new ways of, of working. I believe this should be at the forefront of reimagining um, what the future of manufacturing um, in a post-COVID world would look like. Um, thanks. Thanks for that question from Eric. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, it, it's true that what has been happening with COVID is something uh, none of us were, you know, prepared to deal with because it's, it's something that happened and and, and was a very new space for everyone. So what we've tried to do is to work very closely with the, the manufacturing sector to, first of all, ensure that as far as possible, the operations that can continue, continue. Uh, that way so that we try and prevent uh, and reduce and minimize the job losses during this COVID uh, uh, pandemic. We've also been uh, working to ensure that we have protocols in place that support industry uh, even during this season. And a lot of uh, either our manufacturers or even ourselves as come uh, are just ensuring that we are speaking to our, 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 our teams, our staff regularly, 
that we are providing for them counseling and support for those who require it uh, as, 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 as much as possible. Uh, but the reality is there are certain things that uh, you will, will not be preventable. For example, if companies in, in, in are unable to continue operations. Uh, so ensuring that even in those cases, any mental health support, any counseling support that is required is provided uh, by, by, by employers uh, for, for, for employees going, going through this uh, pandemic. Uh, we're also trying to see how we can take advantage of the new opportunities that emerge out of, out of COVID, whether it's the issue of working from home. I think uh, that, has, that has been a new area for new, many, many organizations uh, where we've been able to realize that people are still able to work from home and be productive. We've also been able to move a lot of our work. Uh, we, we do a lot of trainings and seminars. A lot of that is now happening online. And uh, if anything, the numbers and number of people attending for our membership has been quite impressive, uh, considering it's, 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 it's a new space. So we're also trying to see how we can move into new areas uh, and, uh, and, and take advantage of, of, of the technology and opportunities that emerge. Uh, because the reality is a pandemic like this might be short, but some of the changes that come out of the pandemic could fundamentally change the way we do things going forward. So for those that are positive, we are really trying to inculcate them and incorporate them in our day-to-day -day activities as, as an association. So Felice, just the last question, based on some of the comments you made. Uh, yes. So given declining demand for products, mm -hmm. uh, we have declining revenues. Uh, we don't know how long this is going to stay. Uh, we don't know how long the lockdown measures, the travel restrictions, uh, our capacity to attract overseas markets. Of course, the, uh, uh, there is a vicious cycle in there that, you know, people getting retrenched, that means that there's a uh, decline in, in incomes, a decline in disposable income and discretionary spending. So the US today declared formally that the United States economy is in recession. Where do you think our manufacturing sector is going to land 18 months from now. Are we going to be, we will really have a manufacturing sector to speak about? Will we have repurposed everything to chase after COVID supplies uh, and forgotten everything else that we do? Uh, what does your crystal ball look like? Um, the crystal ball um, into the medium term is that the manufacturing sector will continue to exist and will continue to be a relevant sector. As I said, within the association, we represent 14 sectors. And out of those 14 sectors, 10 of them have continued to be active, uh, even during the COVID pandemic. Of course, there has been decline in demand uh, because uh, we are interconnected with certain sectors. For example, if tourism is down, by and large, a lot of the products we sell to the tourism sector are affected. Uh, however, they have still been activities, say in the food and beverage sector, people have continued to eat with or without COVID and that sector will continue. Whether it's a chemical and allied, the pharmaceutical sector. So there are sectors that have continued to operate even during this pandemic. And uh, going into the future, we see them uh, as, as sectors that will continue to operate. There's also the crystal ball or where we have sat with the ministry and, and said, these are some of the priority sectors we want to support going forward where we think uh, there's an opportunity for growth either for the local market or the export market. So those sectors will continue to, uh, to be supported and to grow. But the reality is that for this year, the growth in the manufacturing sector will be held in some degree. Um, and, and, and that's something I think even when you looked at the economic numbers, even um, whether it's treasury, they've revised the numbers downward. And uh, the manufacturing sector will not escape uh, being one of the sectors that is affected, and uh, our growth this year will definitely be subdued. Um, into the future, uh, depending on how the crisis plays out and how long it plays out, people will continue to consume products, and uh, the priority of reshift, you know, refocusing, changing supply chains, the shift out of China, those are things we want to position ourselves as a country to take advantage of by being cost competitive, by uh, dealing with some of the challenges we've had in the past uh, in terms of our policy and regulatory reform. 
So we are very hopeful and optimistic as a sector normally, despite the challenges, that there are better days ahead and that we are going to align ourselves to take advantage of the opportunities that we present themselves. Thank you very much, Felix. That was extremely useful. Uh, and it's good always to end on a happy note that uh, the future is bright. I really like the point that we have to reposition ahead of everybody moving supply links to China. If that happens, are we the next big manufacturing hub for this region? So thank you very much.